By working with the dying, hospice nurses gain an insight into death and the opportunity to witness the signs of a life beyond our own. I had one gentleman uh, three months after I started working in hospice. I thought, I can't do this anymore. This is just too, too much. It, I'm going to get burned out or it's just too stressful. And um, so just as I was really trying to debate whether I was going to leave this field or not, um, I had an experience that just kind of blew me away. And one of the LPNs came up to me and said, um, Mr. So-and-so just died. And so I took that information and we said, all right, we'll call a physician and call a coroner and get all the information that we need. And I was walking down the hall making bed checks and sure everybody was okay. And this one old fellow was um, climbing out of bed. He was really out of pain control. And um, I was thinking, you know, we need to just get him settled down. And um, I walked into the room and I said, let me help you get taken care of. And he said, I got to get out of here. And I said, I, I understand, you know. And he said, I, I have to die. And I said, you know, I would probably want to die too if I had that much pain. And let me help you. Let me see what we can do. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I have to die. And I said, well, I don't know where it came from. I said, well, you have to wait till you get your own invitation. Sometimes you, it, just because we want to die doesn't mean we get to die. We have to wait until, until it's time. Well, that guy down there just got his invitation. He said, I knew him from Lyman. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he just shuffled by here. And I, <laughs> hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I said, uh, I thought that was a curious term, shuffle by. And um, he said, I, I want you to go get my son. He said, I knew him. I knew him from Lyman when we were kids. And he said, and he just shuffled by, and he points from his door to the window and how it crossed in front of his bed. And I thought, boy, there's a lot I don't know yet. I had a kid that um, I lost last week who saw horses, that he saw a horse. And his dream was about two weeks before he died, he was on this big brown horse. And they were going through this field and it was very smooth. It wasn't like a gallop, and, but they weren't flying. And he said that all of a sudden they kind of jumped over a barrier. And when they landed, they landed in a river bank that had overflowed its, its beds. And it stopped, the horse stopped and turned sideways waiting for this kid to tell him which way to go, whether to go into the woods or out of the woods. And I asked him which way he chose, and he said, well, we went out. And I said, what do you think would have happened if you'd gone into the woods? He said, I think I'd have been gone. And I told him I thought he, had, he would too. And I told him that that horse would probably come back for him when it was time for him to go. That horse would be the one to come back. Well, that afternoon, his mom was washing dishes, and the horse came and she went to talk to him and she asked David if his horse was there and he said yes and she said I think he's probably here to get you and she said I think so too and within two hours he had he had gone he had died on his horse you, you feel a presence you feel something is in the room you know that there's something there um, and, and one time there was this man and he was really really close to death and um he was very, very weak, and, and he looked up, and he, he was looking at something, and he looked very, very scared, and the nurse said to him, um, it's okay, they're there to um, help you, they're, they won't hurt you, and, and he put his hand up, and, and he had his hand up like somebody was holding it, and he did this for a few minutes, and there is no way this man had the strength to hold his hand up by himself. Uh, and he died just a few minutes later, too. So, there's something. I had one really neat fellow um, that we were taking um, to the hospice unit, and um, he was really close to dying, and his, um, his son was nearby. This poor guy went through an incredible bath from the nurse, I mean, and he didn't move at all, didn't even blink an eye, so we would say he was unresponsive. And as we were walking down the hall, pushing his bed down the hall, he opened his eyes and he looked straight up and his little toothless mouth and he went <gasps> and waved and then just um, smiled and closed his eyes and five minutes later he was gone. I don't know who he was waving at, but that's not uncommon. As death approaches, patients may have visions of angels or see tunnels of white light. Other people receive angelic comfort from someone they already know. 
patients who are closer to their dying time will see those who have already died, oftentimes. They'll talk about dead grandparents sitting at their bedside, brothers who've died before. Um, I'm not so certain that we just see spirits running around. I don't really believe that. I've never heard anything that scary, but I have heard of a lot of patients who are very afraid of dying talk about seeing a father-in-law in the kitchen. And that would scare me out of my mind, but they're not afraid. And it really made me realize about how they, they're just sort of drifting to the other side. They have one foot here and one foot somewhere else. And a patient who's very frightened will tell you that. And yet for some reason it doesn't bother them. That bothered me. But Mary was a 52-year-old woman. Um, she had Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, it, was, it was getting pretty bad. She was pretty close to death. And the muscles in her throat were closing up. They weren't working very well. And she had this fear that she was going to drown, um, which is essentially was a real possibility for her. And one of her last wish was that her mother not be told. Her mother was 90 years old and her mother, she liked to be called Grandma Rose, and she just said, this is too hard for a mother to go through, to watch a child die, and especially the way I'm dying. I don't want my mother to know. Now the family was in conflict with this, but it was her last wish, so what could they do? And then the story, as Grandma Rose tells me, is she, was, she lived in Texas. And one night she went to bed. She was getting into bed and she saw her husband standing there. And her husband had been dead for 20 years. But she says that he was as real to her, her as I am to you. And he said, Rose, I've come to take Mary home. And at that point, Grandma Rose, she just started to scream and said, No, no, please, let me go back and hold my baby one more time. Don't take her until I've, I've gone and I've held her and I've said goodbye and I've kissed her. Please don't do that. And so he just kind of smiled and, and faded away. And she knew at that point that he would allow that. So she got on the next plane and she came to Denver. And um, for three days she stayed with her daughter and she told her stories, and she combed her hair, and she gave her bath, and she was holding her daughter um, when she died, and, and I was there, and she just looked at me, and she said, you know, I brought her into the world, and it's only right that I'm with her when she goes out. And, and that would have never happened if Mary's husband wouldn't have come, come to her and told her that he was taking her home. Like one person said to me, well, it's easy for you to say it's going to be peaceful. You're not going to die, you know. And I, you, you know, you're right. All, all I know is what I see, and all I know is that somewhere along the line, you're not going to be afraid anymore. Somewhere in that last, those last hours, it's going to go away. Yeah. Somebody will throw you a lifeline.